Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome. It is so lovely to see you and thank you for sharing your time and being here with us this afternoon. My name is Stephanie Ehrlich and I'm the Van Cortlandt Park Administrator and the Executive Director of the Van Cortlandt Park Alliance. Today's presentation is an outgrowth of ongoing work that we're doing to bring to light the history of Black and Native American people in creating Van Cortlandt Park. This is a history that's not very well known, but should be. Please visit our website, vancortland.org, to learn more about the Enslaved People Project and download a free curriculum for your students or for your kids or for yourself. I want to thank Bronx Council on the Arts for their support of this program and Community Board 8 for their support of the Enslaved People Project curriculum. Many thanks to our partners at NYC Parks, Department of Cultural Affairs, and the Historic House Trust. And a special shout out to the Enslaved People Project team, Laura Carpenter Myers from Van Cortlandt House Museum, Nick Dembowski from Kingsbridge Historical Society, Jackie Fisher and Deprater Deprater from the Community Task Force, and my colleague, Christina Taylor from Van Cortlandt Park Alliance. Van Cortlandt Park is a really important part of our community, and especially now. It's a place where people can go to exercise, feel good mentally and spiritually, and just be in nature. During these crazy times, we're all looking for ways to find happiness and good things to get us through the day. The park is a place uh, that's there for you to do just that. I know it's my happy place. I hope it's yours too. If you would like to support the park, we would be very happy if you did. Visit vancortland.org. Your gift, no matter the size, helps us keep the park clean, safe, and beautiful for the community and helps us do programs like these. So on to today's program. We are very, very happy to share with you Lenape Delaware Arts in Indian Territory, History, Survivance, and Renaissance, and equally pleased to introduce Joe Baker, Executive Director and Co-Founder of the Lenape Center. A few housekeeping notes. On your screen on the top right, click on the view um, spot up in the top right and click on side-by-side -side speaker so you can see the presentation and Joe Baker. Please note that your mics will remain muted and the chat will be closed during the presentation. There will not be a question and answer period after the presentation, but if you have questions, please send them to info at vancortland.org within the next 24 hours and we'll forward your questions to the Lenape Center. Then we're gonna compile all of the answers and send them around to all the participants. Joe Baker is an artist, curator, and educator. He is the executive director of the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center in Mashantucket, Connecticut. He is co-founder and executive director of the Lenape Center. Mr. Baker is an enrolled member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. The Lenape Center has the mission of continuing Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homeland, through community, culture, and the arts. Since 2008, the Lenape Center, based in Manhattan and led by Lenape elders, has created programs, exhibitions, workshops, performances, symposia, and land acknowledgement to continue the Lenape presence. Lenape Center pushes back against erasure and seeds the ground with Lenape consciousness for the next generations. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation as part of the Lenape Center's mission. Please welcome Joe Baker. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to spend a bit of time with you uh, today. I appreciate you being here. Um, my story begins in Oklahoma, not the Oklahoma we think of today, but Oklahoma in the sense of Indian territory a place where manifest destiny blanketed the land and the climate in one's own family. An unspoken story passed down to the children from one generation to the next. It is an Oklahoma that I have not so much observed, but what memory can't let go. Indian territory was a place of creativity, lawlessness and reinvention. Andrew Jackson, Jackson from 1814 to 1824 took the lead in negotiating treaties that traded Indian lands that whites desired for further settlement. The United States acquired parts of Georgia, Tennessee, Mississippi, Kentucky, and North Carolina, and most of Alabama and Florida. In 1830, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act in response to the Indian problem, 
which authorized the United States to set aside lands west of the Mississippi for tribes. Following in 1834, Indian Territory was created, what we now know as modern day Oklahoma. Within less than five decades, more than 60 tribes had forcibly relocated to Indian Territory. In 1907, with the establishment of statehood, Oklahoma assumed jurisdiction over all territory and much of Oklahoma fell in the hands of white settlers and entrepreneurs with the discovery of oil. Next slide, please. What you're seeing here is a photograph of my, the only known photograph in our family of my great, great grandfather, Simon White Turkey, who was born in 1826 in uh, Cape Girard, Missouri. And Cape Girard, Missouri was one of the relocation areas uh, of the Lenape people um, through forced migrations from the ancestral lands here uh, along the Eastern uh, seaboard uh, to Ohio, to Indiana, to Missouri, to Kansas, and eventually into Indian territory. It was in Lawrence, Kansas, um, then the last Federal Reserve of the Delaware uh, people that he met and married his wife, Carrie Sarkoxy, and had nine children, Marshall, Dutch, Robert, Katie, Albert, Lucinda, George, and Lily. Both George and Lily were born uh, in Indian Territory and not uh, on the Federal Reserve in Kansas. Simon White Turkey was a scout for the Union forces during the Civil War and figures prominently in the Lawrence Massacre, Quantrell's raid on Lawrence, Kansas in 1863. Confederate guerrillas attacked the city with the intention of burning the city of Lawrence to the ground and killing all the inhabitants. Quantrell's raiders were met uh, and successfully turned back by Simon White Turkey and a fellow Indian, Shawnee Indian man, uh, Pelea. In 1868, the main body of Delawares were moved once again, transported to Indian territory where um, we purchased lands from the Cherokee Nation. And those lands comprise much of present day Washington County uh, adjacent to the Osage Nation um, at the side of the uh, Caney River. At this point in time, upon the arrival in Indian territory, our people numbered 900. Between 1887 and 1934, Native Americans lost control of about 100 million acres of land, about two thirds of the lands held in 1887. The Dawes Act of 1887 or General Allotment Act sought to break up reservations in favor of individual ownership. Each head of household was assigned 160 acres single children, the age of 18 uh, or older, received 80 acres, and those children uh, uh, younger than 18, 40 acres. What this meant for the White Turkey family alone uh, was uh, an area of land that included 1,000 acres. This land eventually became mostly oil producing. Next slide, please. This is a photograph of my great grandmother, Lily White Turkey, who was born in Indian Territory in 1873. And she's standing um, uh, on lands of the lands of her allotment north of Dewey, Oklahoma. She was a fluent speaker and spoke limited English. I remember her fondly uh, as a child she would visit uh, our family 
and bring free toes, always free toes to the kids. She married James Randolph Fugate in 1890. Uh, he arrived in Indian Territory from uh, West Virginia, just ahead of the big oil strikes in 1897. They together had seven children, five of which lived uh, to adult, adulthood. All of our family's allotment land um, was located within the geographical, um, geological rather, area known as the Bartlesville Sand. Oil and gas production was heavy um, from, from this area. Next slide, please. Next slide. I'm so sorry, I'm trying and it's just not going. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> this photograph is of a white turkey family member, George White Turkey and his uh, wife and children. Um, Jeanette White Turkey is located in the lower right uh, hand uh, quadrant of the photograph. And she um, was one of my favorite uh, family members. I remember her um, distinctly growing up in, in that uh, Oklahoma space. Um, her children uh, sought to uh, relocate uh, to uh, Phoenix, Arizona and California. And we sort of uh, regrouped. I moved there myself in 1981. So this part of the family, George White Turkey and Lily White Turkey's family have always been um, intimately connected. Next slide. We're having technical difficulties. Oh, there we go. Okay. This photograph is of my grandmother, Stella, on the left, and her three, her two sisters, Pearl and Bess known to me as Aunt Pearl and Aunt Betty. They are departing Oklahoma for Cotty College, a girls finishing school in Missouri, where my grandmother was enrolled in the Music Academy. After only a few short months, they pleaded with their parents to return home to Oklahoma. They arrived at exactly the time which has been described as the reign of terror. 1910 to 1930. Corrupt law and government officials, guardians, entrepreneurs sought to gain access and control of Indian allotment land by whatever means possible. All the major oil companies had um, their early beginnings in Oklahoma. Phillips Petroleum, City Service, Sinclair, Getty, Skelly, Conoco, HV, Foster, they all came from that area. The Nellie Johnstone number one well was brought in April 15th, 1897. And from that moment of time really began uh, commercial productivity of oil in Oklahoma. That land or that well was located on the allotment of Nellie Johnstone and uh, so named. I'm reading now from my personal journal, which um, was published in 2007 by the National Museum and the American Indian and the Heard Museum in conjunction with Remix uh, and exhibit uh, new modernity, modernities in a post Indian world. Two Chevrolet, Chevrolet Bel Airs are parked two spaces apart on Main Street. My grandmother's two sisters are distanced by 40 year silence taken to death. As different as alike, they hold tight some long ago family secret. Aunt Pearl had certain Methodist ways. She wore only brown and married one time, 
her hair pulled back in a tightly held bun. She was forever shading her hands, uh, her, her eyes with her hand. She was polite, but reserved. Her white husband was a veteran of World War II and worked the lease on her allotment lands. Together they had one son. They lived in a small unpainted house, lease house on the eastern edge of the allotment. Her hands wrapped around, her lands rather, wrapped around mothers to the north and west. Her wells were pumping, ours were not. One late afternoon, we drove out to the land something mother liked to do. It was tornado season. Soon a greenish yellow cloud fell over us as the winds kicked up the trees along the river. Mother looked to the east and said, get into the car now. My sister and I clambered uh, into the back seat, watching the sky through the back windshield as the car lurched and churned through earthen ruts toward the gravel section line. No words were spoken as mother gripped the steering wheel and turned the car into the driveway of Pearl's place. My sister and I saw the cellar doors just uh, north of the garage. Wait here, mother directed as she got out of the car and moved purposefully toward the back door. Pearl stepped into the yard, shading her eyes with her hand, looking toward the car and up at the sky. Suddenly mother turned and bolted toward the car. In one quick motion, we were in reverse, heading fast toward town, the dust behind shielding the sky. No words were spoken. Aunt Betty wore only color, had one son, and married five times. She wore Chanel perfume and couture fashion she purchased in Kansas City. Her beauty was unchallenged, seductive, and misleading. She fought furiously for love, stabbing those who deceived her with the broken ends of beer bottles. Her white husband was a veteran of World War II and worked at various jobs. Her allotment lands were gone. She never spoke of Pearl. We walked on Main Street, our silence shaped by unspoken actions long ago. Refugees of US policy, the allotment lacked, pious Christian thought and greed. Our lives were lived always spaces apart in worlds split by silence. We walked. Stella's three children, my mother, Liberty, and her two brothers, Victor and Wilbur, were still young when she fell, Stella, suddenly ill and died in 1924 in what I believe was a failed attempt to gain access to her allotment lands. The coroner's report state, states cause of death, poisoning. 10 years later, her 18-year-old son, Wilbur, would suffer a similar fate. I'm reading now from the Bartlesville Daily Enterprise, May 17th, 1934 edition. Headline, Dewey Youth Killed by Train. The mangled body identified as Wilbur Wright was found at 6.40 o'clock this morning on Santa Fe tracks, a mile north of Dewey. Parts of the body were scattered for 700 yards and the arms and legs were severed from the body. He was scheduled to testify in the weighty Wittenberg forgery case. The coroner's report reads, accidental death. How do you accidentally fall in front of a speeding train? Next slide. The year is 1957. The place is a town named Dewey in the state of Oklahoma. I am 11 years old. Excavation has begun on North Creek Street, a block from my childhood home. 
That 1907 bungalow, a white clapboard structure with a sagging porch and creaky pinewood floors, appears heavy on the landscape, weighted down by family secrets, whispered stories shared around Saturday night bitch games with relatives, gatherings lasting some time until first slide. Perhaps the events unfolding then were some kind of rite of passage and an inevitable coming of age played out during the Cold War period following World War II. Or perhaps creativity was being unblocked in me, propelling me toward an attraction for the original that still moves me today. Whatever the case, mediocrity no longer held my attention. During the months ahead, my interests would be focused on North Creek Street as cranes set into place, massive beams defining the triangular roof of the C.A. Comer residence. The structure hovered over the lawn like a spaceship. Diagonal slices of glass cut through the brick exterior, creating transparent portal portals to interior spaces. The roof floated above the exterior walls like a low hovering cloud. I was completely transfixed. I was not the only one who noticed the strange new house on Creek Street. Cars lined up on Sunday afternoon, slowly cruising the construction site. There were incidents of vandalism and letters to the editor of a local newspaper referring to the residents as a monstrosity and eyesore. The Comers themselves were rumored to be communists, progressives, individuals to watch out for. How could something so original, fresh, forward-looking, exciting be so maligned? How, can, how can, could contemporary architecture elicit such angry responses of disgust outrage and suspicion. And sadly, even to this day, we have our haters who are emboldened by the current politics of the US government. Next slide. In 1991, I was awarded a fellowship to research the uh, collections uh, at National Museum of the American Indian. This is a bandolier bag um, that you're seeing, which is in that collection of NMAI. I don't remember specifically if the collection history stated Kansas or Oklahoma for this bag, but nevertheless, um, it is from our home uh, area. I spent a week in New York City uh, going through the collection, which at that time, was housed in the Bronx before it was moved to the new facility in Sweetland, uh, Suitland, Maryland. I, I remember that time vividly because I was somewhat shocked and unarmed to learn that much of the Lenape material, the Delaware material in that collection had been acquired by H.R. Harrington in the 1920s from our, our own community in Copan and Dewey, Oklahoma. Next slide. It's another outstanding bandolier bag. Um, all of the examples I'm showing are from the 1850s, that era. Uh, this is quite bold in its simplicity. Um, our bandolier bags are distinguished by the wide uh, uh, strap and the three tabs. Um, and normally, this bag being the exception, uh, you will see a bilateral symmetry. The beaded motif uh, is uh, what I would call an abstract floral motif. Um, and the pink and blue uh, beads available, seed beads during this period of time are quite striking, often referred to as uh, crow pink and crow uh, blue. Generally, these all bags have um, uh, seed beads size 10, um, and all of the beading is contour. The shapes are generally outlined in white or 
light blue or light pink, and the areas are contour beaded within that uh, internal shape. The beading uh, stitch is a two needle applique sti a stitch, um, or sometimes referred to as spots, spots stitch. Next, please. Here's another uh, bag which illustrates it's held in a private collection, uh, again from the 1850s, uh, which is a, a, a good um, example of bilateral symmetry where one of the diagonal stri uh, straps uh, changes into uh, uh, another design. Next, please. This bag is in the collection of the Autry Museum in Los Angeles. Again, you see that pink and blue uh, uh, color combination palette. Um, this has uh, fringe attachments on the tab in the bag. And the bag is that square shape, which is distinct to Delaware um, uh, bandolier bags. Next, please. Oh, this is, uh, the, the order is a bit reversed, but let me speak to this bag. This bag, uh, I, I beat it. It's a bag that I beat it in 1998. And uh, it's the second bandolier bag, which, which um, uh, I created. And, and let me go back to, to the motivation uh, for the research around the Delaware bandolier bag. Growing up in Oklahoma, I had never seen in any of our gatherings, uh, the dances, or the community, community gatherings, a bandolier bag in person. I'd never seen one worn by anyone in our community. And I thought that these were such powerful and significant examples of beautiful work that were very distinctive to our culture that somehow I was gonna figure out how to make one and that I wanted to bring these back to our community and re reintroduce the uh, bandolier bag uh, to our people. So that was really the motivation for that first initial research into the collections at NMAI. And then the process of uh, self-education about constructing the bag uh, and uh, creating the beadwork. Next slide, please. Well, we're missing uh, bag number one, which I'm wearing. <laughs> and let me, uh, this is the first bag that I made, which uh, was uh, beaded in 1994. And the pr uh, previous bag that you just saw in 1998. And let me go back to that 1998 bag. I remember when I, I wore this bag, took this bag back to Oklahoma um, for the Delaware Powwow in 1994. Um, it caused uh, a lot of attention and people would come around our campsites to see the bag. Um, and they didn't fully understand what, what would come of that experience, but from this one act, other bags have been created. The next bag in our community that I remember um, seeing was a bandolier bag made by Annette Ketchum, tribal member. And there are other members of our tribal community who've made um, uh, other such uh, fine examples of Delaware beadwork. Um, in 1998, that previous bag, um, I was in a position where I needed money. And um, the, this is really an interesting sort of serendipitous moment when the Pequot Museum of, um, approached me and asked me if I would be interested in uh, selling that bag. And it was something I thought long and hard about. It's not that I wanted to uh, give the bag up but that I, I needed to um, 
I needed access to some money at that time. So I sold the bag to the Pequot Museum. Uh, uh, and now I'm here um, at the museum as the executive director. And after all those years, um, I sort of now have an opportunity to revisit the bag, uh, which is an interesting uh, full circle moment for me on a personal level. What you're seeing here is an installation, the bandolier bag on the right, uh, and fabric designed by myself, which um, is another example of that Delaware, a very specific kind of Delaware uh, abstract forum motif. This uh, exhibit uh, was uh, at the, in 2010, at the uh, Museum of Art and Culture uh, in New York City, uh, Changing Hands 3, Art Without Reservation. Next, please. And there's a close-up of the bag. You'll see, um, you'll see that uh, sassafras leaf motif, which is also um, the motif that we use, the graphic design element for Lenape Center. You will see it worked into this bag. Next, please. This uh, was a, a different type of uh, beaded bag for me. Um, it was a figural uh, bag of, of very personal work. Um, this was created in 1997 during uh, the vis visible Hale-Bopp Comet, which you see on the left. And it's a personal bag about my dog, Will Rogers, the German Shepherd, uh, that was very important. Uh, to my life and times at that, at that uh, time in my own personal history. Um, let me say something about technique. I'm, um, I'm not uh, technically a, a, a great technician in terms of uh, bead application. I don't mind all of the um, tension that's created when those lines of beads are laid one next to the other. They really, they require a long time to create. They require a certain focus and they record in many ways your own personal uh, story as time moves forward. Sometimes you might be tense, sometimes you might be angry, sometimes you might be frustrated. Um, all of those things, those, those elements of personality come through uh, that running stitch. And it really becomes a, a very, a, it's like a diary of your experiences. Also, now that we are in the winter months, uh, I think about the fact that, you know, it was historically uh, a quiet time uh, where these important pieces uh, were created. Uh, people were not outside, people were inside. And it was a time of reflection um, uh, and, um, uh, and calm, which best expressed itself for this art form. Next, please. Again, uh, my bead work, uh, you'll see the, the straps of this bag and then a beaded belt, um, which is diagonally placed on top of the, uh, of the other uh, two beaded areas. Next, please. You know, I've often found, you can see on the upper left uh, corner of this slide, the backside of the beaded strap. Uh, you can see the stitches and those chicken uh, track stitches are very typical of two needle applique. Uh, to me, they're very interesting. They're like roadmaps of, of uh, your activity on the, on the face of the work. Um, it's also interesting uh, 
for me to uh, look at all beadwork uh, and examining different examples in museums. Uh, I have found uh, the paper patterns to sometimes be um, pages from an old Sears catalog uh, or uh, gas bills, uh, fuel bills. Um, the patterns are stitched upon the wool backing and then the beads um, are pulled on top of that. And you can see the paper pattern here in this example. Next, please. Again, the stitch work. Next. And here's my most current example of a, a bandolier bag in progress. I'm almost there. I have two more uh, shapes to fill in those white shapes on the left uh, and the tabs need to be cut and beaded. Um, on the right, that pattern is, I, I'm wondering if anyone recognizes that leaf. Uh, the leaf is from the horse uh, chestnut tree and um, it, it's, um, you know, it's taken directly from nature and reordered and reconfigured uh, uh, to create a, a pattern. One thing I love about beading and about this process is that the surface itself can become very animated and active. Um, and that is created, that possibility is created through the use of color and uh, the contour beading. So I, I hope to, um, you know, within the next couple of months, uh, have this bag finished and up and running. There are two questions which I always find amusing that people ask when they um, see a bandolier bag. The first question is, how much does it weigh? And the second question is, how long does it take? How long does it take to make uh, uh, a bag of this of this nature? And you know, my answer to that is, it takes as long as it takes. <laughs> and um, sometimes, you know, you could spend a year in in working on a bag because it's not something that you you can do uh, continuously, day after day after day after day. And the other thing that I've learned um, in this process is that. The human personality has a great capacity for focus and concentration, but because of our very active life and world today, there's a great deal of resistance. And that resistance I experience personally if I've been away from a, a beadwork project for quite some time and I come to beading uh, new. I'll find myself creating all kinds of excuses for not being still and not being present and not being um, available to the work. And so it's, it requires a certain surrender of oneself, a certain commitment um, to the process of creativity and a certain appreciation for the beauty and the goodness that will come through that kind of focus and concentration. And in conclusion, I would say that survivance and renaissance is best expressed, not by going after people, but by finding expressions and a beauty and good works that can touch our everyday lives in very, very powerful ways. There's great power in the bead. It's very, very small, but it's very powerful. And it can be uh, a part of a greater renaissance for our people. And not just the Delaware and Lenape, but all people. We must, at this time, it's very critical time that we return 
to the calm expression of beauty. So I thank each of you for spending time uh, this evening, late afternoon with me. I appreciate um, your presence and allowing me to share my story, um, my personal story of family and my personal work. And I wish the best for you. Um, stay safe, stay strong, and keep wearing those masks. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Wanishi. Thank you, Joe. That was beautiful. And we were just noting that the, the colors of this beautiful piece are our colors at Van Cortlandt Park Alliance. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and we are moved by the, the use of nature and um, the leaves as a, as a focal point and as a design element. So that's, that's really just lovely. And I like the way that it relates back to the park. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I wanna thank everybody for being here with us this afternoon and, and do wanna remind you that if you have questions, you can email them to info at vancortland.org and we will get back to you. Please send those questions out to us within the next 24 hours and we'll compile them and, and send them to the Lenape Center for them to, to answer. And um, thanks again to Bronx Council on the Arts and Community Board 8 for their support. And thank you to you for spending the afternoon with us. Have a great day. <laughs>